Peter Risby overcame incredible odds to find success as a prospector in the Yukon. His is a tale of hardship, strife, and close calls, all which he faced with tenacity and resilience. The odds were against him from birth. Born in Kansas in 1931 to a black railroad porter and a white nursing student, his family had to escape the Ku Klux Klan. They fled to Canada and uh, came up to northern Alberta where they settled in a Cree community, um, an area called Sandy Lake. They were widely accepted as a mixed race family in this Cree community. And so my dad grew up learning how to hunt and to fish and to navigate the bush. As a child in that Cree community, at seven years old, Peter was taken to residential school but escaped. It's quite a distance from where the residential school was in Demeray, Alberta, to where the farm was in Sandy Lake, Alberta. And so he navigated the bush on his own, snuck out in the middle of the night. And um, as far as we understand, it took him a couple days to get back to his farm. When the authorities came looking for him, the Cree community kept him hidden. He grew up working on the farm. At 16, he became a special constable for the RCMP as a Cree translator. Because he had only been in the school for a very short period of time, he didn't have any formal education. So his grandmother and mother taught him how to read, and then the community taught him fluent Cree. Known to his friends as Pete, his life became a series of close calls. The first at 18, when he joined the military and fought in the Korean War, where he survived an explosion. He had shrapnel that was embedded into his legs, so he was found unconscious and um, sent to a uh, military hospital in Japan. So he was there for about six months, and then he was discharged and then came back to Canada. That's when Pete started his career in the mining industry as a prospector, one who was as much at home meeting investors as he was working in the bush. His work took him to South America, the U.S., and northern Canada. He started at the asbestos mine in Cassier, British Columbia. He was there for a few years, and um, he roomed with a geology student. And so this completely changed the course of his life, where um, he just became fascinated with prospecting and mineral identification. Pete was a tenacious explorer. He loved getting out into the field. He was very personal with rocks. You know, it was his life. It's what drove him to be in nature and to find and discover things that, you know, other people didn't really see possible. His close calls continued through his career, surviving a plane crash and a helicopter crash. And so the pilot got a little bit too close to the mountainside, so clipped the mountainside. Dad jumped from the helicopter just, you know, mere seconds before the rotor decapitated his seat. When rescue crews found them, they were unconscious and thought to be mortally injured. Another geologist was holding my dad's hand and he felt him squeeze. And so he said, he's still alive. So they medevaced them, um, both him and the pilot, to Whitehorse. It wasn't all dangerous adventures. Pete Risby was a successful prospector with a stellar reputation. He staked over 3,000 claims. He went on to prospect through the Northwest Territories in an area called Godland Lakes and so discovered a copper, gold, lead, zinc tungsten property with his Indigenous partner, uh, prospecting partner, Art John. And so that property laid the foundation of Welcome North Mines. And so he went on to find about 80 different prospects that were later optioned to major companies. He probably just got really good at it. He had another thing too, he moved a lot of properties and he had the personality to do it. He could come in and people could feel warm up to him almost right away. With a personality like that to be approachable, it probably was a, it probably was a benefit when he was trying to um, option or sell his properties. Pete became known for his unique approach to prospecting, which he was happy to pass on while mentoring others in the field. One of the biggest lessons that Pete taught me as a young geologist was to always look for things that other people aren't looking at. And Pete, every single day, I remember in the field, he would spend every evening sitting down, looking at the rocks as the sun was setting, and almost kind of like talking to each and every single one. He, his heart was in everything he did. Pete was ahead of his time in being committed to diversity, teaching and hiring Indigenous crews. Pete was raised among the Alberta Cree 
He wished that Yukon First Nations were integrated more in the development of mining in the territory, as well as the industry as a whole in Canada. Pete had great confidence in First Nations as natural prospectors, and he began teaching prospecting and mineral identification courses to Indigenous students. Some of his graduates were involved in major mineral finds. I would watch him interact with them, teach them things, and as the season would progress, I would watch this group of people come back with new skills, and not just new skills, but just the enthusiasm. He was the type of person that, you know, he believed no matter your race, identity, you know, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, he believed everybody deserved a chance and an opportunity. In 1981, Pete started looking to do placer mining. Really started making a name for himself. He also uh, was the first to start exploiting placer gold in the Indian River area of the Yukon. And now that's a major placer river in the Yukon. He was one of the pioneers for that. In 1996, Pete was named Placer Miner of the Year and inducted into the Yukon Prospectors Hall of Fame. When asked about Pete, people always mention his sense of humor and storytelling abilities. He was a lover of music and nature. We had a camp pet, and it was an Arctic squirrel that we called Griff. And he really became very fond of Pete, and Pete became very fond of him. I really did appreciate the way he operated, and you know, he was kind, and he was always personable and that sort of thing. And the tenacity was, was something else. He was an individual. He kind of blazed his own way. He was the type of person that stood out in the crowd and he knew what he wanted to do and, and he went after it. Even in his 70s, diagnosed with cancer, Pete was unstoppable. He would go out on his own, you know, with an ATV and, you know, it was just, he was so used to that life. It was just so ingrained in him that um, there was no stopping him. He was very determined. He was uh, somebody that was tenacious. He was someone that really never gave up his passion for finding new mineral showings and develop and then staking them and then developing the properties. Tara spent several months each year with her dad on his projects in the Yukon, a place she loves and a place that became Pete's final resting place. It, it holds such a place, special place in my heart. I, the Yukon is my favorite place in the world. And uh, we actually scattered his ashes near our old mining camp. So we wanted, you know, dad to be back and back near the Indian River. I really, I really miss it. I have so many great memories up there. Tara carries on her dad's legacy as director of his mining company, 7606 Yukon Limited.